Well, Johnny already gave you the overview of the SEEDS project. And so I would like to give you a bit more of a sense of, let's say, the key scientific considerations behind the project and how we translate that into technology and into this specific SEEDS paradigm that Johnny already outlined to you. So, um, so I will start talking a little bit about big data and why this, this issue of big data is, is so relevant right now um, and then why this also has very unique challenges that we have to address, I believe. Um, and then from there, I will draw some, some conclusions that will bring us to this idea, okay, <coughs> there are some key steps missing in this sort of meaning chain, if you want, from big data that we try to fill in with, with the SEEDS project. Um, important to keep in mind, of course, Johnny already uh, laid out to us, this is a large integrated project, so there are many partners involved. Um, so what I'm talking about is certainly not only the work of, of SPEC, my research group, with a really collaborative effort across all the partners of this project, but I might not mention all of them all the time. But just keep this in mind with respect to the technology that I'll be, I'll be discussing. So this is a scientific instrument that actually changed uh, the course of our history as, as humans, right? Because this thing actually has an aperture. And, and this is the telescope that Galileo built uh, based on earlier design by Dutch uh, spectacle makers. Okay. And Galileo built this, this telescope because the idea was there, the idea of the Copernican revolution, right? That our planetary system might be all revolving around the sun. The idea was around, but the data was missing. <coughs> and here, Galileo understood that if we would have an instrument to be able to observe the planets, he might actually get additional data that would help him to now make a key decision, right? Is it right or wrong? So that's what he did. Here we see demonstrating this to the Doge in, uh, in Venice in 1609. And he observed it in the faces of Venus, right? The shadows that you would see on Venus as it revolves around the sun, and this clearly indicated to him that Copernicus had been right. So, um, and this then changed our whole view of the universe, of God, and everything that followed. So what we see here in the case of Galileo is that the idea was there, but not the data. Data was expensive, right? Data had to be fought for, it was hard to get. And it also meant that the theory that, that Copernicus had advanced had to be supportive observation, but the observations are not always easy, right? So that also then gave Galileo, if you want, the honor of defining what's called, if you want, the standard model of scientific inquiry, where from our theory we will deduce our predictions, right, or from our observations we will induce theories or rules, okay? And it's in this loop between theory and observation that we try to evolve and then advance our understanding of, of reality. Okay, so far, so good. And indeed, if you now then start to pose the question, but how do we really know that the theory actually means anything? Right, and actually scientific theory, and then the scientific theory is this, if you want that collectively as humans, you would say, this is the best and most advanced uh, form of knowledge that we have of the universe. Um, then um, our theory, scientific theory, should have a number of properties. Right? It should be able to explain, predict, and control. It should be able to explain phenomena. It should explain why the shadows of Venus are what they are. Right? They to predict, for instance, they could predict once this was the Copernican view of our solar system was merged with the Newtonian view of gravity and gravitational forces being proportional to the mass of objects, suddenly the wall in the trajectory of Uranus was actually predictive of the existence of another planet. And indeed, that became Neptune, right? That's how Neptune was discovered, a very classic scientific event, because for the first time, a mathematical consideration made a prediction that was validated. But thirdly, that's also a forgotten aspect of scientific theory. We want to control, we want to control reality. You think about building a new experimental apparatus to test a certain prediction. It's also part of, a, of controlling reality. Or you build a device that might fly because you have a theory about flight. Okay, so 
the three criteria of scientific theories are explained, predicted, control. And this is going to be important when we're going to discuss the data, the big data challenge of the day. Um, and indeed, if we now jump to the life sciences here at Watson and Crick, it's a few centuries after Galileo. And Watson and Crick had exactly the same problem. What we see here is that for Galileo, the language of the universe is mathematics. But here you see that, that for Watson and Crick, the language of nature is a bit a different one. It's a physical model. Right? Their theory in the end was a physical model. But if you read their autobiographical notes on this period, you see they're anxiously waiting for the data right? that Rosalind Franklin has to produce. She does x-ray diffraction on DNA molecules, and it's through these diffraction patterns, of the scattering of x-ray by these by these uh, molecules that you can actually make an inference about the shape. And those shapes are then tried to reconstruct using these mechanical models. And the big discussion was, for instance, okay, is the backbone of DNA at the outside or at the inside? Okay, and the, the diffraction data helped them to, to resolve that ambiguity. Um, but then again, here we saw there was an idea, right? Actually goes back off to the Schrodinger. If you read his essay, What is Life? He's predicting uh, the role of DNA in the inheritance of our, of our genetic uh, properties. And then Watson and Crick actually gave substance to that idea and validated it with data. And then something interesting happened. Okay? So Watson and Crick started <coughs> here in the 1950s. And here we look at all the publications in the life sciences since the 1950s still about now. And we see exponential growth. All right? So we see after the 50s this incredible increase, and now we're talking about a million publications a year or so in the life sciences. And what you have to keep in mind about every publication is a data set, effectively. In most publications in the life sciences is somebody reporting on some data they collected. All right, so this gives you the most indication how our data is exploding. And another way to look at that is this is about the size of, of a standard DNA database, 15 terabytes. But if you go to other disciplines like climate research, you see that we talk about orders of magnitude larger data sets. And now actually in 2020, the so-called square kilometer array will come online, which is a radio ast astronomy uh, measurement system, which will generate uh, 22 billion terabytes of data a year. Uh, the authors of this claim that's large on the capacity of internet, but then when I tried to find out what's capacity of internet, no one would tell me. So okay. it's a large number, all right. And so, so the, but the point about this is, is you see what happens in Galileo, right? Now data is cheap, but ideas are becoming more and more expensive. All right, you really get the gist of the story here. Um, so we have big data. Big data is easy. Right? You can use your phone and generate loads of data, like, oh, just me walking through London, I have all this amazing data. Um, and some people call it also data deluge, right? That this is, we have to keep a firm eye on this issue that, of course, more data might, of course, also mean that we will drown in, 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 in terms of our understanding of this data. All right? So more data doesn't automatically imply understanding. So now this, this problem has been addressed in the life sciences. Um, in, in some sense, okay, so let's now look at, at the consequences of this. All right, so here I've split out the data in neuroscience on um, publications on, with keywords in the title or abstract of neuron and brain, stroke and rehabilitation, and theory and brain. <coughs> and we see that they're sort of keeping up if we normalize them to their own totals. The growth keeps up but a little difference in the offset, like theory became a bit more popular later than, let's say, understanding of the stroke. So, but a lot of data here and a publication on the brain, a lot of certain deficits of the brain, and also we have theory, okay? But this increase of data doesn't also translate in an increase of understanding, doesn't, doesn't improve our, our grasp of reality. Well, now recently, Button and, and co-workers published a really nice review paper in Nature Review Neuroscience, where they basically show that most of the neuroscience studies are underpowered. That means the number of the 
the sample size they consider is often too small for the conclusions they want to draw. Now this might sound boring to you, but this is very important because it means this exponentially growing curve, where we don't get a million publications a year, what this meta-analysis shows that the majority of these publications have a power in the range of 8 to 31 percent. That means their probability to actually report something that is real is fairly low. Okay? So this is now a problem because we have a lot of data, but also we have uncertainty about what it really is reporting to us. Is it an artifact or is it really out there? Secondly, and this is the winner's curse that they also put their finger on, with lower power, the probability to report artifacts goes up. Okay, so they might just be reporting spurious effects that are resulting from very small uh, sample sizes. Again, this might sound like the boring statisticians stuff, but that's not true. Okay, because the point is the trend in our world, and you're all part of this, is big data. You all read these studies like, oh, Facebook has measured of 10 million people and do all sorts of things and whatever, and then they see these minuscule fluctuations in the data. The, the statistical significance of data matters now because we talk about large numbers of observations. Okay? This doesn't mean all data is bad, but it means we have to be cautious. So, I told you earlier, the criteria of scientific theories is to explain, predict, and control. Now, if we look at this, at this meta-analysis of neuroscientific data, it shows this data cannot just explain and predict, because the majority is apparently reporting things that are spurious, that don't exist, that are artifacts. So they're not explaining or predicting anything. Not good. All right, so big data is not helping us here. Now, the second thing, this is an analysis I did with a colleague of mine, is, okay, let's look at this issue of control. Is our ability to, to measure more of the brain also enhancing our control of repairing brains that are broken? Now, if you take stroke, that's like the simplest deficit of the brain you can imagine because it just means there's a hole in your brain. Neurons are gone. You know what the problem is. There's just a piece of tissue that has died, that's necrotic. It's not something like Parkinson's disease where you have very diffuse changes to the brain, more difficult to control, or schizophrenia, okay? This is a well-defined problem. So now here, we, what we analyze, these are about two dozen meta-analyses of the impact of stroke rehabilitation uh, using the same clinical scales. And what we see, which really astonished me, is that the correlation over time is zero. So from 1975 to about now, Right? Our, our ability to influence stroke recovery in the face of an exponentially growing database has stayed the same. All right? I think this is shocking. So it means we also have no control. All right? So what I show you now, we go back to our old friend Galileo. He tells us what the scientific theory is about. Okay? Explain, predict, and control. He had to fight to get this data. Now data is cheap, we get it for free. But we lost our ability to explain, predict, control with no more theory. This is our problem. By buying into cheap data, we became empty headed and gave, have given up on theory. Alright? And this is a problem. Because it's only when we give meaning to this data that we can actually have an influence on reality. Alright? So this is not just a frivolous issue. It's a fundamental problem. So that's our challenge in the SEEDS project. So how do we go now back from, from big data to, to some sense of understanding? All right, how do we now um, fix this problem? Well, some people have tried in, in, let's say, pragmatic way. So I was a member of the OECD Global Science Forum on Neuroinformatics in the mid-90s to the early 2000s, where we discussed about unifying neuroscience data. All right, to at least try to find ways that data is, let's say, easily shared and reused and so on. All right? So that is one step, which has led to the creation of a special institute in Stockholm that does that. Um, and, however, the impact has not been 
that's amazing. And right now we see that both in Europe and the US, massive initiatives are being are underway to to try to tackle the brain, try to understand the brain. But again, you see the emphasis on generating more data. Like a human brain mapping project in the US, it's all about building new probes, building micro robots that can go in the brain, get more data, and so on. But we just saw more data is not automatically solving our problem. Um, so we'll just go like this, with still the same associated problem. So how do we go from big data um, down to uh, a solution of this problem? So for me, big data is the problem, and it's not our solution. So this is our solution. Um, this is an experience induction machine in which we have built a technology that is trying to assist researchers in a very specific way to get a grip on big data. So our problem domain is the brain, right? The brain is this incredible organ produced by evolution that brings us from the past into the future, but it creates this future by actually learning about this past. It's an amazing adaptive device that actually defines everything that we are and everything we experience. Everything we are is our brain. It's an extreme way. Or you might want to give your body, but okay. the brain is essentially it. Um, the problem of the brain, and that's what makes it different from Galileo's problem, is that the brain is defined at many levels of organization. From the molecules that make up the ion channels that allow electrical currents to flow and nerves to generate spikes, to, let's say, societies, cities, or even the world, right? Our collective brains are able to change the climate on this planet. It's amazing. So, brains are organized at many levels of organization. That makes it a unique problem. Um, so how do we get now to some better understanding of this brain? Well, let's first look at this issue of control. Can we, can we, have, can we exert better control over brains that are broken? Well, actually, we, we built a, a mixed reality neural rehabilitation system where we, based on theory of how the brain operates, which will not really explain now in great detail, we made a list of about 12 criteria to which rehabilitation protocols should obey in order to be effective in rehabilitating a brain that has a hole in it due to stroke. And we now have tested this on acute and chronic stroke patients. We have treated a few hundred patients by now. And we can show that this works better. Uh, so here we see for an increase in speed over time with, with the patient group, these are the control groups. Um, this works better than, than the standard treatments you can get today in the clinic, like occupational therapy. Right? So, but we went here from a theory to controlling the recovery of a patient. Okay, we didn't follow the standard what's called evidence-based approach where any correlation is great. We went for a science-based approach where it was the theory we were testing. And actually, on top of that, we were able to predict specific patterns in the brain that had to occur if these principles were at work and we found them also using fMRI. Okay, so so far so good. So it's possible. We to really go from theory to our data, following the more traditional model is feasible, but it's still not enough. Because how can we keep up with big data in terms of generating our new hypotheses? Right? In, in the past, there were hypotheses in which we might be capturing data, but now we have the data, we have to sort of catch up with our hypotheses. This is a tool that we need to think about. So how do we build a hypothesis accelerator? It essentially means you have to think about a technology that taps in what's called the logic of discovery. It's an old debate in the philosophy of, of science where you have the logic of verification, what makes knowledge true, right? And you have the logic of discovery. How does the human mind discover new things? And we want to move to a more decision of the logic of discovery. And then actually, Charles Sander Pierce, the famous pragmatist, American philosopher, late 19th century, and the name of this, they call it abduction. But look, you know, it's not only about deducing specifics from general uh, knowledge or induce general regularities from specifics. In between here is the creative step, which I call abduction. That's where your world model changes, if you want, where you have an insight, where you generate a new hypothesis. So how can we build a technology that can help the researchers of today abduce 
right, to deal with these big data sets in an adaptive, adaptive sense. For that, so this was our first axiom. How do we get abduction? How do we build a technology that can feed abduction? So the second axiom then is, okay, we have to tie this to creativity. Right? There's some things I know about creativity, not, not a lot, but some. And most of the stuff we know that is solid goes back to the 19th century, the people like Helmholtz. Um, we would actually see different stages in creativity. And what's interesting about this is that there are like subconscious components and conscious components. He would say, look, there's a preparation and an exposure phase followed by incubation where you're just not aware, you're not consciously dealing with the issue. But it sort of, it runs along in the background somewhere. And then there will be this moment of insight of illumination and verification where it becomes conscious. So what we try to achieve now is to build technologies that can help this preparation and incubation phase. Right, to facilitate and to accelerate our ability to generate new ideas about the data that we use. So incubation is a subconscious process. John also alluded to this in the third axiom. Essentially, and there's some, some, a number of theories on this, like global workspace theory, the dynamic core, uh, Bars, the house, and Jerry Edelman, and other people. The bottom line is that it is this Cartesian fallacy to believe that our conscious mind is the determinant of our behavior. It's not. Right? There are classic experiments that show that our consciousness is always lagging behind real-time operation. Famous Lisbeth ex uh, experiments right, from, the, from the 70s. So, um, and then Wagner has pushed this further by saying, well, you know, the causal relationship between action and our mental states is fully subconscious. And these conscious, the conscious pathway is more like a post-hoc rationalization. So that means if we want to drive creativity in the scientist, we have to find a way to access this subconscious pathway. This is what we want to achieve. Um, so how do you do that? Right? So you can rely on miscellaneous magic, but we thought we could do better than that. Um, and it looks a little bit like this. We have a data set, we have a user, but in between the data set and the user are a number of stages of processing. On the one end, it's, it's a, a, an arrange of presentation methods of this data, so the user can basically select different ways to view, interact with the data, but not only visualize it, also in real time analyze it. And there, on the other end, we are analyzing both conscious and subconscious or implicit and explicit states of this user. In particular, we extract implicit states by looking at the states of the autonomic nervous system. Think about arousal, change in heart rate, breathing, of any skin response. But you can also look at the EEG, change the EEG, might tell you something about the predictive capabilities of brains and so on. So, we extract implicit and explicit channels to, in some sense, make the subconscious conscious to this user. Okay. Why is that important? Well, the point is, our brain is also fooling us all the time. We are, we are going through life in real time based on heuristics. And some of these heuristics bias our decision making. You might be familiar with confirmation bias. You walk in your doctor's office, you haven't opened your mouth yet, he already knows what's wrong with you. Right? From then on, you only pose questions to confirm this hypothesis. We tend to confirm what we expect. This is not the best way to gain knowledge. Right? Or things that we have seen a lot look more trustworthy look more reliable, even though they can be completely wrong. It's just a frequency of observation that counts. Okay. So this is very much what's driving our conscious states. But we have to bypass also these biases. And that's why we want to enter at this subconscious level. Um, again, we do this based on theory, which I won't explain to you, just to tell you it's all true. Um, this is the theory I've developed on my brain over the last uh, 20 years. The key thing is, this is what drives our technology, because now we're again testing a theory directly. So the technology fails, the theory is wrong, and we learn something. That's good. Um, so actually, and I will step through this rather quickly again. We have mapped the whole seed's core architecture that presents data, measures the user, makes decisions, uh, chooses certain narrative pathways to, to present information, all of this is mapped to this architecture, an architecture again of mind and brain. Um, so we try to be as systematic as we can. And what does that look like? So here we have a person exploring the connectome. 
Um, this is what we have now. So we have wearable devices like a vest that measures heart rate, breathing, electrical response. We have a glove that allows the user to point and grab virtual objects. In real time, we get now all these measurements of both implicit and explicit states of the user. And we have now also augmented this with uh, eye tracking. So essentially, we have our XAM space. We track uh, in a labeled fashion groups of people in real time. And now these people can wear uh, eye trackers so that we also can know exactly what people are looking at in real time combined with pupil uh, dilation, which is an interesting measure for cognitive states. So we have mapped this now to uh, the virtual objects. We have the intersections. So here's an example. Here is, this is a little, little test of the system. So, so that now means that we have basically full access to all possible states of this user, including their eye movements. Eye movements have both unconscious and conscious components, right? So you want to have both of these available to you. Um, so with that now, we think we can generate uh, big data, uh, big ideas from big data. So I'll give you an example now how this is done. So here, for instance, now the workspace is organized in case of the neuroscience application as this is the instantaneous workspace of the user. Time flows in this direction where we have basically unconscious states on one side of the space, conscious states on the other side. We call this discovery and hypothesis. And here, we, this is more like a memory, a log of all productivity that the user can resort to later to get like a map of how they have explored the data. So here's an example how this works. So if Alberto interacts with a, a human connectome, um, every dot is an identified um, location in the brain. He can now inject activity in these nodes and run simulations to understand how these nodes are also connected dynamically. There's actually quite a problem if you if you look at, at brain data. It might tell you something about structural relations, but not about functional relations. So here, Alberto sorts the data in real time in terms of complexity. So he can now see what are the key hubs in communication and what are more the peripheral nodes in this system. And again, he can make a virtual lesion. He can take out a number of them again again and see, okay, how does this interact? And how we're going to, how we are now using this is to well, this is a diagnostic tool again for our stroke patients. Because now I can try to understand better, okay, if I have a, a defined lesion of a certain patient, what are the knock-on effects of other parts of the system? These are capabilities that don't exist today in the clinic, but we think we can make them available in this way. So you see, Alberto is now interacting with this, this complex data set. It's about about 1,000 nodes and 39,000 connections among these nodes in a fairly intuitive way. And the key thing is just, it has to give him all the tools to develop hypotheses on functional relations in this brain. With that, he can go back to a patient, he can go back to a laboratory experiment to test that hypothesis. But this should give him the control over that complex data set. Okay? Yeah, okay. Two hours, yes, okay. So. <laughs> the point is, and this is often a problem in this domain, uh, the big data is too important to leave it to the engineers. All right? So, because what often happens in this domain, people build something cool, like yesterday I had some guy presenting stuff to us about data visualization. And it's all cool, okay? But you ask him, but how do you know whether this works? He said, well, no, I don't know, but I like it. <laughs> and that's just not good enough, right? Because a scientific theory should explain, predict, and control. So therefore, what we do is also we, we go back and we perform more psychological experiments. Okay, but it doesn't really have an impact. So this is one of these experiments on the data you just saw, where we have one group of subjects work with the state-of-the-art connectome viewers that are used everywhere in the world, and in, in green, okay, versus a group of users that is using our system. And afterwards, they are just asked to explain what's the causal structure in this data. What, what is the connectivity exactly? So it's a very objective measurement of understanding. It's, you know, either you say A and B is connected or you say it's not, right? So it's very simple. And what we see here is that uh, in our case, uh, for different measures, also accepted measures of this structural understanding, using this system shows a higher level of 
deep understanding of causality in these models than using the state-of-the-art tools. So we believe that with that we're on the right track. This will work. Um, so, from big data to big ideas, some conclusions. What we often forget is the prime and primary and most important instrument of science is the human mind. And we cannot replace that with big databases and search engines. All right? <coughs> Rule number one. So that there's no salvation in, all, in automatic solutions, machine learning, whatever. It's not going to happen. So the ability to generate data is outpacing our ability to understand it. Or, so John Doyle, a good friend of mine, control engineer from Caltech, said, you should stop this pedophilia. Right? It's not about getting more data of understanding it. So big data right now is the problem of the solution. And with C to try to build new instruments to help the human mind to catch up with data of this kind of complexity and scale. <coughs> so let's call this the XCM hypothesis accelerator or the seeds hypothesis accelerator. So we constructed this, we applied this successfully to this neuroscience data set. And I showed you where we're really measuring understanding in our users then it looks like we're onto something that would work. All right. So we, in that sense, are very optimistic. Uh, we have other applications. Uh, one, as Johnny mentioned, is with respect to uh, the Holocaust and uh, the Barry Bells and Memorial site, where you have another problem to solve. I will show you a very short video clip. I think it's an important one. I want to show it to you. And the second one, domain, is then archaeology. So this is a one-minute clip to give you an idea of what we do with respect to the Holocaust. So foolish. It is so schön. The Heide, the Bäume, the Vögel. It is a nature reservat. That was not. That was exactly the opposite. slowly about the place in a jeep with the chief doctor of Second Army. I find it hard to describe adequately the horrible things that I've seen and heard. But here, unadorned, are facts. All right, so I get to tell you, it's not about data, it's about meaning. And meaning we have to find in many different domains. And the SEAS project tries to build a new technology to help humans find data or find meaning in the data we extract from reality. Thank you. Well, Johnny already gave you the overview of the SEEDS project. And so I would like to give you a bit more of a sense of, let's say, the key scientific considerations behind the project and how we translate that into technology and into this specific seeds paradigm that Johnny already outlined to you. So, um, so we'll start talking a little bit about big data and why this, this issue of big data is, is so relevant right now um, and then why this all helps. So what we see here in the case of Galileo is that the idea was there, but not the data. Data was expensive. Right, data had to be fought for, it was hard to get. And it also meant that the theory that, that Copernicus had advanced had to be supportive of observation. But the observations are not always easy. Right? So that also then gave Galileo, if you want, the honor of defining what's called, if you want, the standard model of scientific inquiry. Where from our theory we will deduce our predictions, right, or from our observations we will induce theories or rules, right, but just keep this in mind with respect to the technology that I'll be, I'll be discussing. So, this is a scientific instrument, 
that actually changed uh, the course of our history as, as humans. Right, because this thing actually has an aperture. And, and this is the telescope that Galileo built uh, based on earlier design by Dutch uh, spectacle makers. Okay. And Galileo built this, this telescope because the idea was there, the idea of the Copernican revolution, right, that our planetary system might be all revolving around this very unique challenges that we have to address, I believe. Um, and then from there, I will draw some, some conclusions that will bring us to this idea, okay, that there are some key steps missing in this sort of meaning chain, if you want, from big data that we try to fill in with, with the SEEDS project. Um, important to keep in mind, of course, Johnny already uh, laid out to us, this is a large integrated project, so there are many partners involved. Um, so what I'm talking about is certainly not only the work of, of SPEC, my research group, but it's really a collaborative effort across all the partners of this project, but I might not mention all the involved. Done. The idea was around, but the data was missing. <coughs> and here, Galileo understood that if you would have an instrument to be able to observe the planets, he might actually get additional data that would help him to now make a key decision, right? Is it right or wrong? So that's what he did. Here we see demonstrating this to the Doge in, uh, in Venice in 1609. And he observed it in the faces of Venus, right? The shadows that you would see on Venus as it revolves around the sun. And this clearly indicated to him that Copernicus had been right. So, um, and this then changed our whole view of the universe, of God, and everything that's following.